Hi, I'm Jen Thumb, and I'm the Inga Maranato Curatorial Fellow in the Division of Academic and Public Programs at the Harvard Art Museums. And I'm a specialist in the art and archaeology of ancient Egypt. And today I'm really excited to share with you one of my favorite objects for teaching in the gallery. Now I guess my favorite object for teaching with online. Um, it's a work of ancient Egyptian art from the tomb of a man called Ptah Shepses. Here it is. And I want to just start by saying that even though this object is part of an art museum collection, the Egyptians didn't actually have a word for art as we know it. So what we call Egyptian art today, it's different from uh, the art that's like commissioned, made by artists um, in our modern period that's meant to hang up on the walls of a museum or gallery. Um, Egyptian art is always functional and it always shows a perfect ordered world that's projected for eternity. This is a relief, which is to say it's a carved stone object, and it's made out of limestone, which would have come from the northern part of Egypt. And this is about how big it is. Uh, it's around 37 inches long and uh, almost 13 inches high and actually only a couple of inches thick. This relief dates to the period of Egyptian history that we call the Old Kingdom. So this is the first period when Egypt is really a unified state as we think of it now. Um, more specifically, it dates to the period of rule that we call the Sixth Dynasty, which is at the end of the Old Kingdom. That's roughly 2300 to 2150 BCE, or more than 4,000 years ago. It's one of the oldest objects in the gallery right now. As I mentioned, it belonged to a man named Ptah Shepses. And in the Egyptian world, remembering someone's name was really the most important thing that you could do for them after they died. So out of respect for the Egyptians whose names we know, I think it's really important for us to help keep these memories alive, especially since the Egyptians probably never would have imagined that their bodies and parts of their tombs would end up in museums. So I always use the name of an ancient Egyptian person when I know it, especially when I'm talking about the mummified remains of a person or part of their tomb. And I encourage you to do this too. So in the center of the object here, where I'm pointing with my mouse, we have what's called the offering formula. This is one of the most common Egyptian texts. It is a text that allows Ptah Shepsets to have access to offerings of food and drink and other things that he wants and needs in order to um, maintain his life in the afterlife. In the offering formula, the king serves as an intermediary between the deceased person and the gods. And our offering formula has some parts missing. You can see this object was once split in half. Um, but we have this top part here, which says an offering which the king gives. And then we have here the name of the god Osiris, and those are two very important parts of the offering formula. So we know that that's what the whole text in the center would have been like. The most common things that people ask for in their offering formulae are bread and beer, which were the two staples of the Egyptian diet, but they might also ask for other things like linen and alabaster, and sometimes they use a stock phrase that's every good and pure or every good and beautiful thing. On the right here, the right side of the offering formula, we have a text that identifies this as belonging to Ptah Shepses. So it gives us his title. He was a superintendent of the palace. And then it says that he is um, an imahu. And imahu um, is kind of like um, the, the good dead, the honored dead, the revered dead. And then it tells us his name, Ptah Shepses. On the left, we have the same thing, his title, he's superintendent of the palace, he's an imahu, but then here we have his nickname, which was Impi, and the Egyptians use nicknames just like we do, um, and they actually had a phrase for them, they called them the Ren Nefer, which is the good name. On the right here 
in the images, we have Prash Apsas himself, and he's got a staff in his hand and a scepter in the other hand. These are symbols of his authority. So he's got this official palace post. Um, these are symbols that show us that he has some kind of um, standing. Behind him, we have his wife, whose name is Hat Kau, and her name is given here like a caption. And then we have his son, who is also named Impi, and it says that it's his son, Impi, as a caption here. On the left side, we have Tashepsas again, um, and he's got the same implements, but you might notice that he's wearing a different wig. I'm not quite sure exactly why that is. It could be that we're seeing him at different stages of his life. Um, and on this side, he's followed by his three daughters, and their names are Karafet, Iti and Tuit. And what I love about this relief, probably my favorite thing, is that up here it says that they're his daughters whom he loves. And I think we really need to remember that um, these were people who, when they died, they were lost to loved ones and they were remembered fondly in these contexts. I want to just tell you one thing about how I was able to read these captions of names. So um, in Egyptian uh, hieroglyphic script, you can actually read text in two different ways, right to left or left to right. And the way you know which way to read is by finding a sign of an animal or a person. So here I'm circling this bird. That's um, part of the word for daughter. You find an animal or a person and you read in the direction as if you are talking to the animal or the person. So in this case, you would read from right to left as if you're talking to that bird. But on the other side of this uh, object, you would read from left to right as if you're talking to this bird. Um, and you may find it kind of odd that we have these two reading directions on this object. You know, why would we have two reading directions? Why would we have Tosh says twice? A lot of this has to do with balance. Egyptian art is very, very balanced and um, the symmetry is uh, one of the things that you find in lots of different objects from ancient Egypt. And the text being uh, the way it is, right to left and left to right on the same object is part of that balance along with the images. So the aim of Egyptian artists was to depict an object um, as it really is, not as it appears to be. So we could say that Egyptian art is conceptual. It's not perceptual. They didn't use perspective as we know it. Instead, we would call their art aspective. So if you've ever wondered why Egyptian bodies walk like an Egyptian, it's because we're seeing the most characteristic aspects of every part of the human body. And they do this with objects too, but I'll use the body as an example. So the most characteristic way, the most characteristic aspect of showing the human face in the Egyptian mind was to show it from the side. Uh, so you can see the nose, you can see the mouth, you can see the ears, but the eye is always shown from the front. So that's how we get the face sort of looking both from the front and the side at one time. The most characteristic view of the legs, for example, is from the side, but for the hands, it's from the top. And for the shoulders, it's from the front. And that's how we get this sort of composite figure like you see here. And the Egyptians used a canon of proportions in their art, and they had a system of grids for laying out how the different body parts were sized in relation to each other. And a relief like this would have had a grid done in black and or red pigments laid out on the stone before it was carved. And we can't see that grid now, but undoubtedly it's why we have these figures looking so proportional to each other. The living were responsible for the upkeep of the dead, and that included visiting their tombs and leaving offerings for them. And we know that people did this uh, because sometimes we have graffiti left on tombs from ancient people visiting. Um, and, but this relief actually shows us signs of the same care expressed for Patel Shepses's tomb. It's just here. Uh, and a couple other places, this is actually ancient plaster that's been used to repair it in ancient times. So part of the loving care of the upkeep for Ptah and his tomb. 
in the afterlife. What kind of tomb does this come from? It comes from a tomb uh, type called a mastaba. This is the Arabic word for bench. And you can sort of see from the image how that came to be. It kind of looks like a pyramid with a top cut off. Um, and a mastaba is a really common type of tomb for elites in the old kingdom. It has this mud brick superstructure with a burial shaft that would have been inside. And then there also would have been a chapel inside where the living could visit and leave their offerings. What's interesting about this relief is that the type of relief that it is, which we call sunk relief, so the figures are sunk below the relief surface, so they're just carved in. In the Old Kingdom, that usually means that this relief is from an outside space because sunk relief creates really wonderful shadows in the sunlight. Um, if you compare that to, for example, this other relief that's right next to Pashapsas's uh, tomb relief in our gallery. This is a raised relief where the background is cut away instead. This is definitely from an inside space. So in the case of this relief, it could come from the outside of his mastaba. It might be the lintel from a doorway and then the relief type would make sense. But it could also be the lintel from uh, what's called a false door inside his tomb. A false door is like a a door-shaped portal through which his spirit, his ka, could access the offerings and come and sort of visit the living and be in the chapel. Um, but it undoubtedly comes from above a doorway. We don't actually know, by the way, uh, if this was painted, but the intention probably was uh, that it should be painted. And it would be interesting for my colleagues in the Strauss Center to have a look at this uh, with some conservation analysis and see if they can see traces of ancient pigments. Sometimes there's residue there that we can't see with the naked eye, but we can figure out whether or not something was painted. This is object number 1993-222, which means that it was the 222nd object to come into our collections in 1993. And we've titled it the Tomb Relief of the Official Pashepsis, also called Impi. Um, and I really think it's uh, just a, another a great way of acknowledging that this belonged to this real person um, who had a nickname too, and we know him by both of his names. Um, we don't know the location of the tomb that this object came from, but it was probably in the northern part of Egypt because that is where the kings ruled from at this time. And this was a gift from Nanette Rodney Kalikian, who inherited this relief from her father, Charles Dirkin Kalikian, uh, who was a New York-based dealer of ancient art who was really well regarded by Egyptologists. And the gift was made in memory of George and Ilsa Hanfman. George was a curator at the Fogg Museum and a professor at Harvard, and Ilsa worked with him on the excavations at Sardis in Turkey which continue today under the auspices of the Harvard Art Museums. If you'd like to learn more about Egyptian art or see more of our collections, you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter where I post an ancient Egyptian object from our collections every day. Uh, and you can send me an email or comment on this video if you have any questions.